probably heard of CPR before, and maybe you've even had a CPR class, but do you really understand why it's so important and what's going on when you do CPR? We're gonna give you a rundown of exactly what's happening when you perform CPR, what you need to do, and give you a step-by-step -step rundown of the steps you need to take in case you ever have to perform CPR. So why is CPR so important? Well, everything in your body needs blood. It needs the oxygen from the blood. And your heart is the pump that circulates that blood. Without the heart, nothing in your body is gonna get oxygen and everything will end up dying. So it's very important for that heart to beat. It's also important for your lungs to get oxygen from the atmosphere to be able to push that into the bloodstream so the heart can then circulate it around the body. Now, if someone goes into cardiac arrest, that means their heart stops pumping. These people go unresponsive and that is when they need CPR. We'll go into the steps of how to do that and how to check for that in a minute, but if someone's heart stops beating, we are going to take over and do compressions on their chest. When we do compressions, we are simply mechanically doing what was being done naturally in their body before. We are pushing on their chest to squeeze the blood out of their heart, coming back off to allow that heart to refill with blood and then pushing again. We gotta be careful not to do this too fast or the heart doesn't have time to fill back with blood. But we also can't go too slow or else there's not gonna be enough pressure build up inside the body to circulate the blood. Keep in mind too, when you do compressions, it's not nearly as good as someone's heart beating by themselves. So when you're doing compressions, we have to do it a little bit faster than the heart normally would beat to try to keep that blood flow up and we're still not gonna do as good of a job, but it's better than nothing and it can buy them time until they get definitive treatment. Now, do compressions fix people in cardiac arrest? No, they don't. Now the problem with a cardiac arrest patient is their heart has stopped beating, so the electrical activity in their heart that causes the heart to beat on its own has stopped. So what this patient really needs is a big jolt of electricity. How do we do that? Something called an AED or an automated external defibrillator. So when we shock a patient, we are trying to add electricity to that heart to restore the body's natural electricity in the heart so we can restore a normal heartbeat to that patient. So compressions, they buy us time. They keep oxygen and blood circulating in the body to keep the organs perfused until we can actually fix the real problem. Shocking, that's what's gonna fix your problem in a cardiac arrest. Now breathing, what about breathing? That's part of the pulmonary and cardiopulmonary resuscitation. Well, breathing is important, but remember, you can hold your breath for a while. There's still oxygen in your body. As long as that oxygen is circulating, there's still some oxygen being provided to the cells. You can hold your breath for a while before that becomes an issue. If your heart stops though, and there's no blood circulating, that's very bad and you have a matter of minutes before the brain will start to die. So we gotta get on compressions immediately. Then, when we can, we'll add some breaths into that and we'll go over that in a minute. But remember, compressions have to begin initially. The fix ultimately is gonna be shocking with an AED and then we can add breaths in there to keep oxygen into that bloodstream to keep the oxygen going as we're buying time with compressions until we can fix the problem with an AED or in some cases there may be something else such as trauma that we have to address before we can revive that patient. This is a misunderstanding that a lot of people have, so I wanna hit on this one more time. When someone goes into cardiac arrest, that means their heart stops beating. We can do compressions all day long, but unless we fix the problem that caused their heart to stop beating, it's not gonna regain normal rhythm and normal heartbeat. So, if that was a blockage in the heart and we can do some compressions to get some more circulation and oxygen to that tissue and then we can shock the heart, restore that electrical activity, maybe that heart can beat again. If it's a trauma case and they've got a collapsed lung and that collapsed lung is pushing on the heart, keeping that heart from being able to get oxygenated to beat, we've got to fix the collapsed lung. You don't fix the collapsed lung, you can do CPR all day long. It's not going to fix the patient. So ultimately, we have to start figuring out what caused this patient to go into cardiac arrest. Was it a drug overdose? Was it low blood sugar? Was it a collapsed lung? Was it an electrical activity in the heart that we had an issue with? What caused this patient to go into cardiac arrest, 
And until we fix that problem, we're gonna do CPR, which buys us time, but it's not gonna fix the problem until we can nail down exactly what that was. Some of this gets a lot deeper than what we're gonna go into in this video today. The important thing to know though is do compressions, that's very important. Shock them with an AED if you have it, give them breaths if you can, but compressions are of utmost importance. That is buying time until the ambulance can get there to then start figuring out, do we have a collapsed lung? Do we have low blood sugar? Was this an overdose? All these other things, at a minimum, start compressions. I'm gonna go ahead and run through the steps of CPR, but we're gonna talk about two different methods. These two methods come from AHA, the American Heart Association. One is called Heart Saver CPR, the other is called BLS, or Basic Life Support. Heart Saver is meant for a civilian, a layperson that may not have tools or much training. BLS is meant for healthcare providers that have a little bit more equipment readily available, they have a little bit more training, and they're expected to do a little bit more for these patients. Heart Saver CPR is what the American Heart Association calls their layperson or civilian CPR. This is very simple, very basic, and they just want the bystanders to be able to pitch in and do something. If nothing else, at least call 911 and do compressions. So this is very basic stuff, but we're gonna run through it real quick and then we'll contrast that to the BLS for healthcare providers and show you both sides. So for heart saver, you come across a patient who's unresponsive. You need to check and see if they're breathing. If they're not breathing or they're not breathing adequately, you need to contact 911 and start compressions. If you are by yourself, then you can pull out your cell phone, dial 911, put it on speakerphone, put it down, and begin compressions on that patient. If you're with somebody, have them dial 911 and you begin compressions. Hey, hey, are you okay? He's not breathing. Call 911, grab the AED. Also, if there's an AED readily available, say you're in the mall, airport, somewhere in public, maybe you're at a church and your church has an AED, have them go grab the AED so you have an AED. Follow the prompts on the AED. It'll walk you through everything. Once you turn it on, it'll tell you to attach the pads to the patient's bare okay. chest. Adult pads. Stay calm. Check responsiveness. Call for help. Attach these pads to patient's bare it'll chest. It'll tell you to stand back. It's analyzing rhythm. It'll tell you when to do compressions, when to do breaths. It'll walk you through all of that with an automated voice. All you gotta do is turn it on and it'll walk you through the rest. If you don't have an AED, begin compressions. When you begin compressions, you wanna make sure your patient is on a hard surface. So if they're laying in a bed or on a couch, you wanna move them to the floor so you have a hard surface to work on. Otherwise, when you do a chest compression, you're not gonna push down on the chest, you're actually gonna push all of them down into the sofa or the bed, and you're not gonna be getting good quality compressions. So make sure they're on a hard surface. Then you're gonna start compressions. To do compressions, simply place your hands one on top of the other on the lower half of their breastbone. Once your hands are placed, you're gonna lock your elbows out. You're gonna use your body weight to push down rather than your arms. If you use just your arms, you're gonna get tired. So use your body weight. You're gonna push down at a rate of 100 beats per minute. Or you can hum in your head something like staying alive. That will give you about the right rate for compressions. When you're doing compressions, you're aiming for a compression depth of two inches, roughly. It's gonna be hard to figure out if you're doing exactly two inches, but I will say most of the time, people don't typically go hard enough or deep enough. So make sure that you're applying adequate pressure when you're doing your compressions so you're getting good quality compressions. I'm also gonna say, if you hear a rib snap or break or crack, most likely, it's just cartilage that connects the rib to the breastbone, but that's pretty normal. So if you hear that, don't stop. It's gonna be better for them to wake up and have a sore chest than for them not to wake up at all. So keep doing compressions. So when do we breathe? Well, if you're gonna breathe for this patient, you're gonna give two breaths after every 30 compressions. Give your 30 compressions and then pause and give two breaths to the patient. When you're giving a breath to the patient, you do want to try to use a barrier device if possible. That is a pocket mask or a face shield or a BVM would be even better. But if this is a family member and you don't have a barrier device available, that's up to you if you do mouth to mouth. If it's a random stranger in the grocery store, it'd be nice to have a pocket mask with you so you can have that barrier between you and that person. BVM is definitely preferred, but you can use the pocket mask or barrier device. Now that you have your pocket mask or barrier device, place that over the patient's nose and mouth and simply give a breath over one second. When we're given a breath, we're gonna give that breath until we see their chest move. 
When their chest moves, that means there's enough air in their lungs now to where the lungs are fully inflated and it's gonna start pushing the chest out. We don't wanna go any more because we could damage the lungs. We wanna go just until we see that chest flex or that chest move just a little bit. Once you see the chest rise, you're then gonna stop your breath and you're just gonna wait for about a second to allow that air to be expelled back out of the chest. Then give your second breath over one second and then stop, wait another second for that air to be expelled go right back on compressions. The second type of CPR we're gonna talk about is BLS or basic life support. This is what's taught to EMTs, paramedics, nurses, physicians, all sorts of healthcare providers. So this is very common in the healthcare setting and because this is taught to healthcare providers, this is a step above the heart saver. Because these are healthcare providers, a little bit more is expected out of them because they have more training. So a BLS provider is gonna do a few more things. They're gonna check for a pulse. So rather than just looking to see if they're breathing or breathing adequately, trying to shake them and say, hey, are you okay? They're actually gonna do a pulse check. So you wanna to try to tap them and see if they're okay and then check for a pulse. We're gonna check for a carotid pulse. The carotid artery runs on either side of the trachea. You'll take your two middle fingers or your index finger and your middle finger, run it right alongside the trachea, press down to the carotid artery and we're gonna feel for a pulse. When we do a pulse check, we're also going to be look, listen, and feeling for any chest rise and fall that would indicate breathing. So we're feeling for a pulse, we're doing a look, listen, feel for breathing, and we're going to do this for no more than 10 seconds, but at least 5 seconds. If their heart rate is really slow, we may have a pulse, but we may have a hard time feeling it, so we want to make sure we're checking for at least 5 seconds. But again, 10 seconds is our maximum window we want to go without doing compressions. If we don't have a pulse in those 10 seconds, we're gonna go ahead and start compressions. Again, hard surface, begin compressions, contact 911, grab the AED or a heart monitor, and we're gonna go ahead and apply the pads and get all that going. So with BLS, breathing's not an option. We have to breathe. So 30 compressions, two breaths. When we give a breath, we're most likely gonna be using something called a BVM or a bag valve mask. This is a bag we can squeeze. When we squeeze the bag, it delivers air to the patient. We'll likely also use a MPA or an OPA to be able to keep that airway open so we can ensure that that air is getting down to the lungs where it's supposed to go. Eventually, a BLS provider may also put an advanced airway in place like a King airway, or they may go ahead and intubate this patient by placing an endotracheal tube down the patient's trachea. That gives a direct line for the air from the atmosphere through the BVM down directly into the lungs. We'll most likely connect this BVM to supplemental oxygen, so now we have more oxygen for the patient, and there's a lot more things that healthcare providers can do during CPR. But again, this kind of goes into the healthcare provider side of things, um, and this is not something that we would ask lay people or civilians with no supplies to be able to perform. So again, compressions are the most important thing here. One more note, when you're giving breaths, or if you have to move the patient, or whatever needs to be done, the goal is to never stop compressions for more than 10 seconds. 10 seconds is kind of your ideal time frame. You want to keep compressions going as long as possible. When you stop for breaths, no more than 10 seconds. If you stop for an AD check or rhythm check or whatever, the goal is no more than 10 seconds. Now you have to follow the AD prompts, but it should be about 10 seconds at a max. Simply continue this cycle of 30 compressions to two breaths over and over until the ambulance gets there. And swap compressors as needed. Preferably every two minutes, you'll swap out with someone else doing compressions because you'll start to get tired. And what happens is you'll start to get tired but not realize it and your compressions will not be as good as they used to be. You swap someone else in there that's fresh and they're gonna start out strong and have much better compressions. So then after two minutes, you can relieve them and you go back and forth, you're gonna end up with much better compressions than one person trying to continuously do this um, for a long period of time. That is a basic overview of CPR. Again, we talked about two different methods, heart saver versus BLS, very similar, but we're expected to do a little bit more on the BLS side of things. If there was one thing that I could have you take away from this video, it would be do compressions, do compressions well, and don't stop until the ambulance gets there. That is gonna be the most important thing they can buy these patients time. Regardless of the reason they went into cardiac arrest, if you do compressions, you keep that oxygen and blood circulating in their system, until the ambulance can get there, fix the problem, transport them, or whatever needs to be done. But you are now buying them time. If you don't do anything, you literally have three to five minutes until that person's brain starts to die. 
and then even if they are resuscitated, they may be brain dead. So this is very important. Do those chest compressions. If you wanna do the other things, breaths, everything else, go for it, but at least do chest compressions. Well, that's it for this video. We would really appreciate it if you subscribe to the channel, give this video a like if you found it helpful, and then leave us a comment below. Let us know what you liked about the video. And if you have an idea for any future videos or content you would like to see, leave a comment below, let us know. We have done videos in the past from people's recommendations. So we definitely take that stuff to heart and we really take a good look at what people leave in the comments so we know how to provide you with more content that is useful and helpful. So as always, stay vigilant, stay safe.